Welcome to The Biggest Jesus. I'm glad you're here. Is the Son of God a member of the Creature Club or the Eternal God Club? The Son of God belongs to many clubs as the firstborn within many clubs. He is the firstborn of the Mary's Children Club, the Many Brethren Club, the Dead Club, the Creature Club, and the Messengers Club. But one club the Son of God does not belong to is the Eternal God Club. That club does not exist. It is a myth because there is only one eternal God, only one God who had no beginning, the only true God, the Father of Christ Jesus. As we examine the Son of God's membership within the Creature Club, keep this key fact in mind. Throughout the scriptures, the firstborn is part of the group in which it is the firstborn, whether it is firstborn in time or firstborn in status or both. An example of the firstborn in time not being the firstborn in status can be seen in the story of Esau and Jacob. Esau was the firstborn of Isaac in time and status, but Genesis 25, 29 through 34 tells us that Esau despised his birthright and sold it to Jacob for some stew. And Jacob deceived old blind Isaac so he could get the blessing Isaac thought he was giving to Esau. Genesis 27, 19. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Arise now, do sit up, and do eat of my game, in order that your soul may bless me. Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob, and he became the firstborn in status above Esau. So we see how it's possible for one not firstborn in time to become firstborn in status, while the firstborn in time can lose their firstborn status. The title Firstborn establishes the primary position of the firstborn within the group. The Greek word translated as firstborn is prototokos, and it means first brought forth. It occurs eight times in the Greek scriptures, and most of these are about the Son of God. The Hebrew word translated as firstborn is bekor, which occurs 119 times, and bekira, which is used for firstborn females, that occurs six times. Let's now look at the primary passage that reveals the Son of God's membership within the Creature Club. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, from the Concordant Literal New Testament. The Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature. For in him is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him and for him. And he is before all, and all has its cohesion in him. And he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is sovereign, first born from among the dead, that in all he may be becoming first. For in him the entire complement delights to dwell, and through him to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. The Son of God was created by his Father, whom Jesus calls the only true God in John 17.3. Verse 15 tells us God is invisible. The Apostle John wrote in John 1.18, God no one has ever seen. He created a visible image to reveal himself. He created his Son, the image, the firstborn of every creature. The visible image of God is part of the creation. Now the creation can get an accurate revelation of the invisible God through his image, his Son. But even with God's image accurately revealing God to the creation, no one has ever literally seen the invisible God, the Father. The title of firstborn in verse 15 establishes the son within the creature club. Remember the key. Throughout the scriptures, the firstborn is part of the group in which it is the firstborn, whether it is firstborn in time or firstborn in status or both. God's son, the image of the invisible God, is firstborn in time and status and is a completely faithful firstborn son of his father. In verse 18, we see the son also belongs to the from among the dead club as the firstborn saved out of death and made immortal by his father. We see this confirmed in Revelation 1.5 where the apostle John calls the son the firstborn of the dead. Just as he is one from among the dead, one who was dead, he is one of the creatures and is firstborn of both. In verse 15, we see every creature accounted for, including the firstborn son. Verse 16 is stating all creatures were created in him. So the father created the firstborn, then created all others in him. 
This creation was from the Father. The Father is always the source of the creation, and the Son is the channel, through whom the Father creates. No other creature in Scripture is called the firstborn of every creature, which is no doubt an esteemed position, just as Adam is esteemed as the first human. But many, especially Trinitarians and those who teach that the Son of God is in the Eternal God Club, will try to tell us that verse 16 sets the Son outside of the creature club, because it says, In Him is all created. Thus, they say, this all is absolute and encompasses all creatures, therefore excluding the Son from being created and outside of the creature club. But this all is relative, not absolute. Verse 15 establishes the Son as a creature in the creature club with the title firstborn. The all that is created in verse 16 is all that is created in Him, after the firstborn has already been brought forth into existence. All created in verse 16 tells us why he is the firstborn. It tells us he is related intimately with every creature and has a responsibility for every creature created in him as the firstborn of every creature. As firstborn in the group, there is great privilege and great responsibility to take care of all those created in him. Because of his responsibility as the firstborn of every creature, the Son of God reveals the Father to the creatures as the image of God, and all has its cohesion in him. He is the firstborn from among the dead, leading the way for all the rest of the dead to follow. And all creatures created in him, that in the heavens and that on the earth, are created through him and for him. All are his, and the same all will be reconciled to God through the firstborn, because peace has been made for the same all through the blood of his cross. The firstborn laid down his life and shed his precious blood for every single creature created in him, including you. Many firstborn sons in the Hebrew scriptures lost their status as the firstborn and were demoted and replaced due to their failure and sin. The firstborn of our club will fulfill all of his responsibility for us because of his great love for us and because he is able to do all of the Father's good, pleasing, and perfect will, which will greatly benefit every single creature. Let's take a quick look at all created being relative when the Son, the firstborn, is included in the creation. We see this relative use of all in John 1 and 1 Corinthians 8. Here are other relative alls like we just saw in Colossians 1, 16. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was toward God, and God was the Word. This was in the beginning toward God. All came into being through it, and apart from it, not even one thing came into being which has come into being. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Nevertheless, for us, there is one God, the Father, out of whom all is, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all is, and we through him. In John 1, the all came into being through it is the all that is created through the word after the word had already been brought into existence. We see the word already existing in verses 1 and 2 when the word was toward God and this was in the beginning toward God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it is again a relative all that is out of the Father and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the all here does not include the Son, the firstborn, but is the all that came out of the Father after the firstborn. But we do have an absolute statement of all being created out of the Father in Romans 11. Romans 11:36, Seeing that out of him and through him and for him is all. To him be the glory for the eons. Amen. Here we have absolutely all creation coming out of God, through him and for him literally into him. This all is not relative and includes his son, the firstborn of every creature. And we see the fulfillment of all returning into God in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 through 28. For he subjects all under his feet. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. Now whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all in all. At the consummation of the eons, God will be all in all. And this includes the Son himself, who will be subjected by the Father to the Father. 
The man, Christ Jesus, is currently the mediator of God and mankind. 1 Timothy 2.5 Mediation between man and God will no longer be necessary when God is all in all, after all that is out of God returns into God. And notice here the relative alls. Verse 27, he subjects all under his feet, which Paul clarifies in the same verse. Now whenever he may be saying that all is subject, it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him. The all here is is the all that was created in him by God, the all who will be at peace and reconciled as we saw in Colossians 1. We see that same relative all in verse 28. Now whenever all may be subjected to him. The final all includes the Son. God will be all in all, including his Son, who came out of him. There's another informative occurrence of the Son of God being called the firstborn in the first chapter of Hebrews. There the Son is compared to messengers, also known as angels, and the Son is shown to be superior to them. Hebrews 1, 1 through 6. By many portions and many modes of old, God, speaking to the fathers in the prophets, in the last of these days speaks to us in a son, whom he appoints enjoyer of the allotment of all, through whom he also makes the eons, who, being the effulgence of his glory and emblem of his assumption, besides carrying on all by his powerful declaration, making a cleansing of sins, is seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heights, becoming so much better than the messengers as he enjoys the allotment of a more excellent name than they. For to whom of the messengers said he at any time, My son art thou, I today have begotten thee. And again, I shall be to him for a father, and he shall be to me for a son. Now whenever he may again be leading the firstborn into the inhabited earth, he is saying, And worship him, all the messengers of God. Note in verse 2, the son is enjoyer of the allotment of all. The firstborn son in Israel would receive a double allotment from his father. Here we see an even greater allotment, the allotment of all given to God's son, the firstborn of every creature. This is the all that is created by the father through the son. Regardless of who you are or what you've done or what you currently believe, you belong to your Savior, the one who has already made peace for you through the blood of his cross. You are a valuable part of his allotment. In verse 3, we see again that the Son is the image of the invisible God in the phrase, who being the effulgence of his glory and emblem of his assumption. The Greek word for emblem is character, which means a carving and copy, which faithfully expresses and reveals the original. In this case, the original is the invisible Father, and the Son is the visible copy. Still, in verse 3, we see that in addition to being the image of the invisible God, the Son is carrying on all by his power powerful declaration, making a cleansing of sins, and he is seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heights. In verse 4, the comparison of the Son and the messengers begins, and it goes through the rest of chapter 1. The Son is compared with created beings, the messengers, which is a translation of the Greek word angelos, and is translated in many Bible versions as angels. The Hebrew word for messenger is malach. Verse 4 tells us of the Son's supremacy above the messengers, becoming so much better than the messengers as he enjoys the allotment of a more excellent name than they. This comparison is made in part because messengers are often strong and given great power and authority throughout the scriptures, especially as revealed in the book of Revelation. And verse 4 alludes to the fact that messengers are good, but the Son is so much better, and that messengers have excellent names, but the Son's is a more excellent name. And verse 5 tells us the uniqueness of the Son's creation. My Son art thou, I today have begotten thee. The messengers were then created in the Son, the firstborn of every creature. It's interesting that in the comparison of the Son with the messengers, the writer of Hebrews pulls out the firstborn card in verse 6 to show the superiority of the Son over the messengers who are created beings. If the Son was part of the Trinity and is himself an uncreated, eternal God, then there would be no need to throw out the title firstborn to show the Son's status over the messengers. There would be no need for such a long, drawn-out comparison throughout chapter 1 trying to prove the Son's superiority over the messengers who are created beings. 
But we see the Son is the firstborn. Of what group specifically he is the firstborn, we are not directly told. But by bringing up the title of the firstborn, the writer of Hebrews is placing the Son in the same group as those he's being compared to. Is the Son the firstborn of the messengers, making him a member of the messengers club? Yes, he is called the chief messenger in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and he is called the messenger of the covenant in Malachi 3.1, and he is the messenger Jacob wrestled with in Hosea 12.4. This comparison includes him with all other messengers. And since the messengers are created beings, this is also showing the Son as the firstborn of these creatures, which confirms what we saw in Colossians 1, that he is the firstborn of every creature. Continuing in the book of Hebrews, there's an interesting passage in chapter 3 that supports the truth that Jesus is part of the creature club and not the eternal God club. Hebrews 3, 1 through 2. Whence, holy brethren, partners of a celestial calling, consider the apostle and chief priest of our vow, Jesus, who is faithful to him who makes him, as Moses also was in his whole house. This is a very interesting passage that says something pretty amazing regarding the father making his son. It's often overlooked due to a bad translation in the King James Version, which is followed by many other popular Bible versions. This bad translation causes most people to read right over this passage without giving it a second thought. The Greek word poieo is translated as makes in the concordant version and appointed in the KJV. It occurs over 570 times in the Greek scriptures. It means make or do. The KJV translates poieo as made or make 115 times by my count and as do, did, or done 348 times by my count. But it translates poieo here as appointed. It's the only time the KJV translates poieo as appointed. Poieo is used 20 times in the book of Hebrews. Eight times it is translated as made or make in the KJV. Nine times as do, did, or done. One time as purged. One time as kept and one time as appointed. Let's read verse 2 from each version to see how this one mistranslation completely alters the meaning and changes our understanding of the Father's relationship to the Son. Verse 2 in the concordant literal New Testament, who is faithful to him who makes him as Moses also was in his whole house. And from the King James Version, who is faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Appointing someone is drastically different than making someone. God merely appointing his son justifies placing the son in the mythical eternal God club. God making his son puts him inside the creature club where he rightfully belongs according to the rest of scripture. This should cause us to deny the eternality of the son and the doctrine of the trinity. Let's see where the KJV in the book of Hebrews translated poieo properly as make or made. Hebrews 1, 2 from the King James Version hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And Hebrews 1, 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. We see in verse 2 that God made, poieo, the worlds, which is actually in the Greek, ionos, which is better translated as ages or eons. And in verse 7, God maketh, poieo, his angels, spirits. And while we're here, notice in verse 2 the word appointed, which the KJV translated this time not from poieo, but from tethemi, which is one of 16 Greek words the KJV translates as appointed or appoint. Come on, KJV! Explain yourself! <coughs> James? Sorry, mate. Consistency is not my strong suit. But people believe me anyway, and they really dig me accent. They like the way I spinneth the scriptures. Scram! Here are two more occurrences of the KJV properly translating poieo as make and made. Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. In Hebrews 8, 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. 
Here are two final examples of the KJV guys getting it right with poieo. Hebrews 12, 13, And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And Hebrews 12, 27, And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The KJV guys can translate a Greek word properly a hundred times, but it's the one deceptive error that may drastically and negatively affect your understanding of God and His Son. Satan is crafty, and so are his messengers. Let's look at a few more telling verses that show that the Son of God is part of the Creature Club. Jesus is telling the Apostle John to write to the Laodiceans in Revelation 3, 14, from the King James Version. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. By this, Jesus is telling us all that he is the beginning of the creation of God. He is indeed, as we saw in Colossians, the firstborn of every creature, in whom God creates all. John 5:26 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. For even as the Father has life in himself, thus to the Son also he gives to have life in himself. Here we have the eternal God, the God with no beginning and no end, the only true God. The Father has life in himself. The Son does not have life in himself apart from the Father giving life to the Son. The Father is the source of the Son's life. John 6:57 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. According as the living Father commissions me, me, I also am living because of the Father, and he who is masticating me, he also will be living because of me. The Son is living because of the Father. Does this sound like an uncreated, eternal God with no beginning? No. And the parallel here is striking. Just as we are dependent upon the Son for our living, he is dependent upon the Father for his living. God's Son is the created, visible image of His invisible Father. The Son is the firstborn of every creature, therefore He is in the creature club, not in the mythical eternal God club. Understanding God and His Son in their proper places is essential to understanding the truth of who God is and who His Son is. The Son was brought forth by His Father, and the Son is living because of the Father. Belief in the mythical trinity causes people to believe that Christ didn't actually die, because an eternal God cannot die. And the truth that Christ died is one of the foundational facts that we must believe in order to experience our salvation and be sealed with the Holy Spirit. We must believe that He died, that He died for our sins, that he was entombed, and that his father saved him out of death on the third day. Don't be duped by Satan or orthodox Christian lies. The Trinity is a myth. The firstborn in our club loves us and died for us. He has made peace for all of us and will reconcile all of us to his father. We are each and all a valuable part of the Son's allotment. For more on the myth of the Trinity, watch this video next. Wow. Wow.